Hi, I'm Angela Duckworth, and I'm a psychologist, a mom, a former classroom teacher, and I am absolutely delighted to share with you what I am thinking about right now about an aspect of kids' development that extends beyond their math, which is what I used to teach, very important, beyond physics, beyond um, the standard academic curriculum, but I think in really important ways is absolutely essential to students uh, performing well in the classroom. And, and that is the topic of character, um, a term that um, I will unpack a bit for you in the brief remarks I have. So what is character? Well, why are we interested in things like social emotional learning or the whole child, um, the whole person character? I, I think these terms in some ways can be used interchangeably. And the Nobel laureate in 2000, Jim Heckman, an economist, uh, has said that, you know, one of the reasons why we're interested in things like character uh, and students is that when we think about achievement tests narrowly, that can't be everything that matters to, uh, you know, showing up in the world as a productive and, um, and successful and also a good person. So, for example, just from one study that was conducted um, by Jim Heckman and colleagues, um, if you look at long-term life outcomes, like how much money you make per year, your levels of clinical depression, your um, mental health more generally, your physical health, we find that not only do standardized tests or IQ tests have some relevance to these long-term outcomes, but so too do these dimensions of your character or your personality, your social emotional skills, whatever again you wanna call it, these other factors matter, which is why you see the white bars here, which is just an index of you know, how much do these other characteristics matter to these outcomes. You know, that, the height of that bar suggests like, yeah, they matter um, a lot. So character is consequential. Now, what are the dimensions of character or personality or the whole child or social emotional learning? What, what should we care about? Now, personality psychologists would give you these three names for kinds of personality traits that might matter. Agreeableness is about how um, you interact with other people. Um, openness is really your interaction with ideas. Uh, critical thinking, uh, intellectual humility, et cetera. And conscientiousness is really about you and your goals, your ability to achieve the things that you set out to do. So these are three very important dimensions, not the only dimensions of character or personality that you might worry about. You could also call these interpersonal intellectual or intrapersonal capacities. This is the term um, or the terms that the National Research Council chose when they thought about what students in the 21st century might need. But again, if you choose your own terminology, I'm going to choose um, more poetically maybe uh, strengths of heart, mind, and will. However you want to call these, I think as parents, as uh, as educators, we have an intuition that, of course, a young person's ability to interact uh, with other people uh, in ways that are beneficial, their ability to interact with ideas in ways that are beneficial, and then their ability to interact with their own goals, um, uh, like that's beneficial. So, so I think we can agree that whatever you want to call these categories or the overall category, these things must matter, and they don't all show up in standardized achievement tests. I'll give you some very specific examples. This comes from um, a website, characterlab.org. It's my nonprofit. And um, scientists who study gratitude, kindness, honesty, purpose, emotional and social intelligence, I think would agree that these are very important to how we interact with other people. Scientists who study curiosity, creativity, intellectual humility, and wisdom, uh, and of course more, but these would be very important aspects of um, you know, character of the mind. And then finally, the things that I study personally as a scientist, self-control, grit, delayed gratification, growth mindset, proactivity, um, these are you know, aspects of, um, of will. Now, how do we help students develop character? Whoever it is that you are teaching, I think you can think of three um, interrelated factors. Um, students' mindsets, which are um, you know, attitudes, but importantly also beliefs um, that they bring to you uh, when you meet them. Their skill sets, and then of course their 
actual context, the context you create for them, and then, of course, their neighborhoods, their families, their physical and social circumstances writ large. And I want to suggest that character is um, in important ways influenced by these three um, precursors. And, and I want to actually give you a sense of how it is that they all relate to one another. And this is, of course, my thinking, but um, I, I think it makes sense given a lot of the evidence that we have about how kids develop. So depending on their teacher and their classroom and their school and their family and their neighborhood and society at large, and um, this includes, you know, attitudes about race and gender and, you know, uh, physical resources, like do they have um, extracurricular activities, et cetera, these contexts influence um, the beliefs that, that um, young people develop about how the world works and who they are. I think it also um, is important to say that these contexts help shape the skill sets um, that young people have, knowing how to do certain things, knowing how to, um, you know, uh, write a gratitude note or knowing how to practice. And um, I think this diagram shows you um, maybe it's a little more complex than people want, but I think the complexity is important here because really what teachers do, I think, is create the context that shape the mindsets and skill sets that enable young people to develop strengths of heart, mind, and will. And I'll just use one example um, because I know it well, but not because it's the most important example. Of course, there are many things that um, every educator or you know parent would care about with their children, but um, because I have studied this combination of passion and perseverance for long-term goals for a while, I will um, pull this book off the shelf, as it were, and I'll walk you through this model of development from that perspective. Now, it was in 1869 that the great scientist Charles Darwin, in a letter that he wrote to his cousin Francis, uh, that he said, I've always maintained that, um, I'll just update Darwin here, individuals did not differ much in their intellect, but only in their zeal and hard work. This was part of a debate that um, that Darwin and his cousin were having about, you know, what made for achievement in life. And I think the, the thing that they agreed upon was that um, it can't be that we could put these things all together, because sometimes a student or a person is very, very, very intellectually able, and yet they're lacking in the passion and the perseverance that um, Darwin thought was, you know, very, very important. My most favorite current thinker on this topic is um, Will Smith, the, the actor and the musician, and I'll let you listen to a snippet of this interview where he's asked what has made him so very eminently successful. The only thing that I see that is distinctly different about me is I'm not afraid to die on a treadmill, right? I will run. You would not be outworked. I will not be, be out, outworked, yeah. Right. period. Yeah. You know, you might have more talent than me. You might be smarter than me. You might be sexier than me. You might be all of those things. You got it on me in nine categories. But if we get on the treadmill together, <laughs> right? There's two things. You're getting off first, yeah. or I'm going to die. It's really that simple. Will Smith is, by the way, from my hometown of Philadelphia, which is where I'm sitting right now. And um, again, I think this distinction between ability and then something that's not exactly your ability, but more your motivation, your, your effort, your, your passion and your perseverance over really long periods. I think that's what Will Smith was getting at. And, and it's very similar, not only to what Charles Darwin was talking about, but also this great psychologist, Catherine Cox, who around the turn of the 20th century um, did a study of 301 high performers, including the likes of Isaac Newton. So, so people she would consider to be so eminent, she might label them as geniuses. And she actually had access to their diaries and their notes and their handwritten correspondence. And her conclusion was that in addition to ability, these remarkable people had, quote, the tendency not to abandon tasks from mere changeability, not seeking something fresh because of novelty, not always looking for a change, and, quote, the tendency not to abandon tasks in the face of obstacles, perseverance, tenacity, doggedness. So this just gives you a sense of what grit is. Just like Jim Heckman's prior work, it's not the same thing as measured ability, right? It's one of these dimensions of character, uh, a strength of will, I would argue, um, that's just not the same thing as, you know, everything is, is easy for you.
Now, how can we think about the mindsets that would enable a person to be gritty? I think whether it's talking about you or your students, um, the mindset that we are all familiar with by now, I think, is growth mindset. And I thank Carol Dweck, um, who's um, not only a friend and a colleague, but like my hero, um, for this slide. So what Carol has identified is that you can have a belief that intelligence can be developed. She calls that a growth mindset, believing that human abilities like intelligence are malleable. Alternatively, you could have another belief, the opposite belief, a fixed mindset is the belief that abilities like intelligence are not malleable, that they are what they are, that they are. You're a math person or you're not a math person. You're a physics person or you're not a physics person. You're an athlete or you're not a natural athlete. In the face of challenge is when it really matters because when you're getting all A's and everything's great, it doesn't matter. But when you're stumbling and failing and falling, then a growth mindset gives you a rational reason to get up again, to embrace challenge, and to learn something that you think will make you smarter in the future. In random assignment research, what Carol Dweck and um, this study in particular that I'm um, showing you a slide from uh, was led by David Yeager, who's a brilliant psychologist at University of Texas, Austin. Uh, there was a lot of um, you know, work that went into this study. I was one of the many scientists who also contributed. Um, but this work showed that when we tell high school students, in fact, the brain is plastic. Like there's a scientific reason to believe in a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset that new neuroscience affirms that no matter how old you are, your brain is not done growing and changing. Um, that this inclines people toward more of a growth mindset. And that in this study uh, ended up paying off in terms of higher report card grades for students at the end of the year, particularly when they came from schools that really supported a kind of challenge seeking culture. Um, and I want to say that in terms of grit, I have found in uh, longitudinal research that the more a student has a growth mindset, the more I can predict that they will grow in grit. The more they grow in grit, I can then predict that they will grow in growth mindset, et cetera. And as a former math teacher myself, I will tell you, I've seen over and over again, this virtuous cycle, um, you know, a child, a student develops a little bit of confidence. They take a few more risks. They try a little harder. They stay a little longer, um, you know, in, in an in a extra session of work. That grit pays off in, you know, some kind of mastery or achievement, which just strengthens their confidence. And I think the question is, you know, how do we go from vicious cycles where you have deficits on these things to virtuous cycles? And, you know, just a, a flash of the data on this. I know it's not a pretty slide. Um, I do think that's what teachers can do. They can create the context in which we can kickstart a cycle towards a growth mindset and grit. I said that character, in my view, is not just the beliefs that you carry around, um, but it's also encouraged by certain skill sets, knowing how to do certain things, right? Um, and I think one of the most important skill sets that all young people need to learn is this kind of meta skill set, which is knowing how to practice anything, right? I don't think anybody's born knowing the best way to study or to practice, to do well in an algebra class or a physics class, or you know, to learn to play tennis, any of these things that require repetition and practice, there are better ways and worse ways. Um, again, I have a little shot here of a laptop because we randomly assigned students. This was led by my then graduate student. Now she's a, um, a you know, soon to be professor at University of Chicago. But Lauren Eskris Winkler decided that she would share with students. We did this with middle school students and high school students, the science of, of practicing the way experts really practice. And that's different from the way a lot of students do their kind of studying and practice. In particular, um, real experts embrace you know, failure, frustration, and they know that when they're doing something that's too hard and they can't get the answer right away and they're confused, they know that that's a good sign not a bad sign, but a good sign. And that is part of the skill set of practice, learning to set goals that are too hard, learning to you know, keep going even when you're confused and frustrated and learning to seek out feedback, including negative feedback on, on what you can do better. So the skill set of practice is one that I think is teachable. Um, when we tried to do this with middle school students in particular, we told them that it really unfolds in this like you know, never ending cycle with three parts where you have a goal, you got to make sure the goal is challenging, you got to, you know, 
turn off cell phones and you know not multitask 100% focus and then you need to get feedback including negative feedback which can make you confused and feel clumsy but that's a good thing not a bad thing uh, here's a recap of what we uh, you know shared with students although we did not yet at that time have Wynton Marsalis the great jazz musician um, as our voiceover but we did show them videos that were similar to this so let you listen to what practice is um, a recap of what I just described uh, in the words of Wynton Marsalis some people are so good at what they do you doubt you could ever be as great are they born with it hm, not at all Research shows that you can become an expert, too, with the right kind of practice. Expert practice has three steps. First, take the thing you want to do well, break it down into smaller parts, and pick one part that's just a little harder than what you can do now. Second, practice that one skill with absolute concentration. Even short practice sessions are powerful if you focus completely. Third, seek feedback on your performance and reflect on that feedback now, expert practice is not always easy, but as you perfect many small skills, you begin to see how the whole improves to create dazzling mastery. Great musicians, doctors, writers, and athletes all use expert practice. They use it as students, too. You can become great at whatever you envision. What will you choose to master? And if you would like that video to share with your students, just go to characterlab.org. Everything is free. It's a nonprofit. And go to the GRIT playbook. So um, in this slide, I, sh I show you um, what it looked like in, in the experiment where we asked middle school students who had either you know, seen and learned about you know, expert practice or a control condition, we allowed them to do actual deliberate practice in math in particular. So we kind of hacked Khan Academy and we um, made a version of Khan Academy that like really put you in this zone of improvement that was you know, hard um, the, the way experts do. And if you look at the gray screens, those are students who are doing the math. And if you look at the color screens, those are the um, students who are able to do on that particular day anything else they wanted to do in the computer lab. So the one day, I think in history, that the computer um, tech team allowed the firewalls for the school to come down and for students to go on ESPN.com, etc. So the question was, how much practice do students do once they're exposed to the science of, of how experts practice? And we found that in general, um, for the control group, you know, there was less and less desire over three consecutive periods to do practice of the kind that I described compared to just, you know, having fun um, other places on the internet. And here's the treatment group. So here are the students who learned about how science has discovered that experts practice. And you can see that, you know, they're maybe not as enthusiastic as you might want, but they are certainly doing more practice over time than students in the control group, which is what we found in multiple samples. And the students not only did more practice, they got better report card grades, particularly the students who were um, underachieving at the start of the study, who are below the average for the school um, and for their class. So um, in other words, in addition to a growth mindset, what we want students to do if we want them to develop grit is to um, enable them to understand and to develop the skill sets like deliberate practice as one example um, that enable gritty people to do what they do. So that's one example of a mindset, growth mindset, one example of a skill set, practicing. And I want to bring it back to context because this is what teachers really, really do. We create contexts in which these mindsets and these skill sets are able to flourish. Um, there's a study that I did with a psychologist named Annie Park, who's um, again now a professor, was at that point um, working in my lab, and she asked students uh, at various schools to say something about the culture of their schools, and um, she asked them to, in the beginning of the school year, remark on whether, for example, in their school making mistakes was okay, as long as you're learning, and what we found in our joint work is that the more students answered questions about growth oriented school culture um, affirmatively, the more those students increased in their grit, which then translated into increases in their report card grades. Um, and again, I think for all of us on this, the question is like, what is the culture of the classroom that we are creating? Does it signal to students that growth mindset is correct and is you know, valid and it's, you know, you can think about getting smarter. 
you know, if we do that, I think we can see the payoff um, uh, in, in the way that we did in this study. Um, and of course, the same for, for skill sets, though I don't have um, a study directly on that. Um, to show you. So in sum, I think that character strengths like grit, but also gratitude, kindness, curiosity, all the things that we want young people to develop, um, they depend on adaptive mindsets, beliefs and attitudes that students bring um, to the world, and also their skill sets, which they develop. And I think that the context of schools and classrooms is a very, very important place in which these things can grow. And I want to complicate things just a little bit, but just by saying that you know, it's also important to realize that, um, you know, your job is twofold because also you have a responsibility to create a context in which whatever character strengths they have at the moment, you know, this kid's really kind, this kid's really curious, this kid's got a lot of, you know, humor or humility, that it's in those contexts that you create that they're able to even express or show their behavior. So there's a kind of twofold responsibility of teachers, one to help students develop character, another one to create context in which they're able to express their character. Um, and just as an illustration of this, um, the study that I showed you before, led by David Yeager and Carol Dweck, and um, including a large cast of other scientists, um, one of the most important findings was this one, which is um, when you look at the aqua bars in this graph, this is the effect of the mindset intervention on GPA uh, in supportive schools, meaning that um, the schools were supportive of, you know, challenge seeking as a cultural norm. The red bars, which are in general lower, especially for um, lower achieving schools, um, uh, these were the effects still beneficial, but less so when the school culture was not supportive of challenge seeking and so forth. So again, not only important to create context in which mindsets and skill sets develop, but also just where you can even express uh, the, the strengths that you do have as a student. So I've, I've given you a relatively complicated talk, and I'll just say that the reason I think this is also important is because I do think in this somewhat complicated way, teachers are helping students develop character strengths, um, social emotional learning competencies, again, whatever language you want to use, that enables them to thrive socially, emotionally, uh, academically, and of course, also physically. And I think that to me is really, you know, what all teachers and all education is for, you know, the, the game we're playing is, you know, how do we get students to thrive, it must go beyond their achievement test scores, it must go beyond, you know, the standard curriculum to include, you know, all of the capabilities of heart, mind and will. Um, that enable a young person to thrive. And with that, let me put my book back on the shelf and say, I'm so glad we're going to have a conversation because I know that that was a lot. Um, I want to encourage you to visit characterlab.org. I send out a weekly email for parents and teachers based on one scientific insight. The email is readable in fewer than 60 seconds. So it's like a Sunday morning, 60 second sermon based on science, um, one tip every week. Um, and if you um, ask me like why it is that, you know, we're taking the time to even be in this conversation together is that when I grew up, I had great teachers. I had some teachers who were not so great. Um, but um, one thing that's changed since I was in school and maybe since you were in school is that there really is science behind all the things that I um, was giving you a sense of today. There are science behind mindsets. There's science about skill sets, there's science about um, curiosity, about grit, about emotional intelligence, about um, all the dimensions of character that help students thrive. And I hope you visit us um, on the web to learn more. Um, and I want to end, of course, with another character strength, um, a strength of heart, gratitude um, to collaborators and funders for making this work um, possible. Um, and then finally, I want to thank you for your time, because um, you're probably incredibly busy and maybe busier than you were a year ago and um, you wouldn't be in this community of practice if you didn't truly care about kids and um, and their potential and their well-being so thank you so much and i look forward to our conversation but good morning everyone great to see you all thank you for being prompt and i saw lots of people on perusal just now I mean, isn't it amazing? We always blame our students to postpone their, their uh, 
they work until the last possible minute. <laughs> but then we ourselves are no different. I, I, uh, I, I actually started later than I usually uh, do uh, two days ago, but it was really wonderful. And I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, thrilled that uh, we have uh, Angela Duckworth. Hi. Today, who, <laughs> hi, Angela. Great to see Trying you. Trying to like who make is, my picture a little more clear. Yeah, uh, New York Times bestseller author. You know, her TED Talk is one of the most viewed of, of all time. Uh, she's a distinguished professor at the University of uh, Pennsylvania and uh, also the founder and CEO of Character Lab. And that first word, character, of course, is the is the uh, subject of, uh, of Angela's talk, which you saw online. So today, we th thank you very much for joining us, uh, uh, Angela. It's great Eric. to have you back. Yes. Thank you. Um, so as we started doing earlier this year, we have just a discussion. And I thought I'd start... Um, I'd start off by asking a question that uh, Clay Steinfeld, I don't know if you're here, Clay. Uh, yes, he is, asked, um, and that I had a follow-up question to. You know, at some point you show this graph of uh, gross mindset uh, intervention and how it yields a, um, a GPA improvement. And Clay asked, you know, is that higher GPA due to students actually learning more content or is it a product of the teachers being primed to reward effort they see the students exhibiting? And, and that triggered a, a sort of a follow-up question from me. How, how is the, the GPA determined? Well, I know how the GPA is determined, but really what is the assessment like? I mean, this all mm. basically boils down to in some sense, oh, I look like a ghost here today. Uh, I know that's the problem my, with these virtual case. backgrounds. If you like, it's like being in a pool and then like being under the water. And so, you, get, you know what I mean? Like you sort of disappear. I'll try not to move. Um, so <laughs> you at know, least you're not a cat. So that's yeah. good. the assessment is, is critical. Uh, yeah, maybe so. I could tell you guys. So first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really, I mean, it's a Saturday. <laughs> it's like amazing that anyway, wonderful people trying to help kids. That's great on a Saturday. So thanks. Um, uh, and how about if I just tell you the story of that study and like how it, how it like unfolded. And then, and then I think we'll be on the same page. So um, the lead of that study is this uh, wonderful professor named David Yeager, who was like a protege, is a protege, whatever, was a protege of Carol Dweck at Stanford, which is where he got his PhD. And it's a national study. The, 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 the story was like, there were these little studies of growth mindset, which is the belief that abilities like intelligence can change. That's what a growth mindset is. And a fixed mindset is the belief that abilities like intelligence can't change, right? So that's that's the, the, the basic, you know, focus in the study. And there are all these little studies, you know, 500 people here or 600 people there. And those um, studies that I'm referring to are ones where they, um, you know, Carol Dweck and others tried to increase growth mindset shift kids more toward a growth mindset and away from a fixed mindset. And a lot of these studies were successful, but the question was, um, you know, is it really true? But also the reason why it was a national study is, the, um, and I think this will really resonate with us all, is that the idea from the very beginning was that schools are different from each other, teachers are different from each other. And so is a growth mindset, you know, kind of the same in all schools and in all classrooms, or does the context really matter a lot. And that's why it had to be national so that you had schools all over the country and then teachers that were really different, not just like all the teachers in one school, for example, where like there would be more similarity. So we randomly assigned, we meaning this very large team, I was like a bit player, like a supporting, supporting, supporting actress in a big cast or something like, um, but we uh, randomly assigned ninth graders in these high schools um, around the country to condition. And it was random assignment at the student level. So in any given, we did it in math classes. So like, uh, because we knew that all students have math in ninth grade and also because math is um, the one subject um, and you could argue this about physics, but like at least in terms of something that every student is taking math, we knew like American students uh, have a lot of anxiety about, don't like, um, and that 
fixed versus growth mindset might be especially operative there, um, as opposed to other subjects where students might not have as much, you know, apprehension or self-doubt. So randomly assigning kids at the individual level means that in any given math class, half of the kids at random in that same class with the same teacher in the same school, like that half of the kids in that class are in one condition, half the kids in the other. In the intervention, kids go to their computer lab, this is pre-pandemic, and they sit down at a computer and really actually at the moment that they sit down, that's like when they would get randomly assigned, um, I think is how we programmed it. So there's a sort of virtual flip of a coin, you sit down and then you either go through a growth mindset activity or there was a placebo control, which is like you learn about the brain, but you don't really learn about plasticity, um, which was the like the heart of the intervention was to teach kids that the brain is uh, changeable and that like modern neuroscience, you know, shows that's true. And this is why when you experience something like frustration or confusion, you shouldn't think like, oh, I've reached my limit. I'm dumb. <laughs> like, I'll never learn this. You should have a different, um, psychologists call it an appraisal, like a way that you make meaning of what's going on. You're like, hmm, I'm like frustrated. That means it's hard. That means I'm learning, right? So it, it was like, a, frankly, it was like a multi-part thing. It's, it's basically like 50 years of psychological research all shoved into 20 minutes because we use social norms, we used exemplars, we used like persuasion techniques. I mean, really like all these psychologists were like, how do we make the most effective one class period long intervention. Um, there was like a booster follow-up, but essentially it was like two really short things. I think the whole thing end to end was like fewer than 60 minutes cumulatively. So there's the experimental group, there's the control group. And the kids are, um, then that all happened in the early, I think it was like October or late September of the school year in ninth grade, right? So now you've got half the kids in any given math classroom in the growth mindset condition, half the kids like in a placebo control. Then we followed up the students at the end of the academic year and we got their uh, transcripts from their schools. Um, and the finding, as you said, Eric, is that there is a, um, by the way, small. <laughs> it's like a, it's, it's true, but it's really small. I mean, I don't wanna overplay this either. I think there are lots of things that educators have to think about. And also I don't think like 20 or 60 minute interventions are like, miracle cures, I think they just demonstrate the sort of thing that you want to become pervasive in a culture. So it was more like a demonstration that we can move report card grades by a little bit. Um, and the, the, the finding that you had alluded to, Eric, and I think is the most important finding of the whole study, is that the benefit of going through this growth mindset intervention, learning that the brain is plastic and that, you know, frustration doesn't mean you're stupid, et cetera, was larger in certain kinds of schools than others. So which schools was it most effective in? The schools where there was like a cultural norm of challenge seeking, which I can tell you how we measured that. Um, uh, and also like it depended a little bit on academic achievement, a little bit on like, the, it wasn't like the kids at the very, very top actually improved um, all that much, but the kids where the school was, you know, like in the middle of the bell curve in terms of like the academic performance of the whole school. That's a little less interesting than the challenge seeking thing. But the point is, is that I think when we talk about things like growth mindset, um, the take home of this study is that it's not just about the individual student and their beliefs. It's also the culture and the context, um, which can be either very supportive of like, you can try harder, like, you know, things, are, or can be like planting a seed in dry ground, right? Like the seed's great, the student's awesome but the ground is the school. And if the school doesn't support any of the things that the student has in their head, like that, that's, the, the student's not gonna grow. Um, in new data that has not yet been published and still under review, it, you know, we look at teachers' mindsets. Um, I wonder if I can say this, I think I can say this, but <laughs> I'll just say like, the gist of it is that the teacher mindsets really matter. So for example, if you're a kid who randomly got assigned to learn about growth mindset, the brain is plus, et cetera, and your teacher has more of a growth mindset about abilities like intelligence, then you will benefit more also. So it's all pointing to, yeah, individual mindsets matter. I think kids ought to be helped to develop adaptive and accurate beliefs. And really importantly, like schools and teachers as the context, like the ecosystems in which the kids live, you know, matter enormously. Right. Well, that, that, that's wonderful. That may, what you said about the gross mindset and, and teachers matters a lot. I mean, I find the same thing 
with Zatatustu's uh, active learning and uh, teaching by questioning. I mean, there's a there was an instrument that was developed by I think the the author Strick Wells called Attitudes Towards Learning. I'm not the survey. I'm not 100 sure. And he only used it on teachers, but I found it's equally important to see what students' attitudes towards learning is. So it takes two to tango. It's and, both and, 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 right? It's both and. I, I think like in, in this like dialogue that's now going on about social emotional learning, which by the way, I use the word character synonymously with that. I started collaborating with these educators who said like, let's call it character. And I was like, okay, I didn't think too hard about it, but I, I use it pretty much synonymously. And Eric, I think it's both. And like in this debate, I think legitimately people are like, oh, why are you only talking about the student? It's not just their job, right? Like what about the job of the adults, right? And it's both. And I think we need to obviously help individual students like develop adaptive mindsets and strategies. And, you know, and the school culture and the, and the, your turn may say to you, you know how these these interventions really work. When you go through a growth mindset intervention, you don't like come out on the other end like with this like ironclad belief that like intelligence can change. What you come out on the other end with is a suspicion that intelligence can change, a hypothesis, right? So when you go through this whole thing, at the end you're like, you know, maybe maybe I can get smarter. I mean, I'm not 100 percent sure, but like wow, maybe I can get smarter. Now, when you put that kid into an environment where like their teachers ask them questions, they're respected, like they, they have some small wins, like they take a few risks, they raise their hand, you know, they realize it's okay to make a mistake. That hypothesis gets confirmed, right? And stronger. Um, but it's not like these mindset interventions just like brainwash the kids and like, then they like, and I think that's the fragility of these things is, is partly because if you can plant a seed in a, a mixing metaphors here. If we can give the kids a hypothesis, like then you have to confirm that hypothesis through experience. Because if they have three experiences where like, they're like, no, I'm dumb or everyone else thinks I'm dumb, like then there's obviously got to, going to be no benefit. Right. So I, I, I forgot to say at the beginning, please raise your hand if you have a question. I see that I didn't have to do that because people have already raised their question. Remember that in the new version, the latest version of Zoom, you no longer raise your hand at the bottom of the participant list. You have to click the reactions button and then it says- I uh, did not know hand. that. Okay. Yes, they, they moved it around. <laughs> they moved it around. That's so great. I have, I have four hands are shooting up, fantastic. So okay. Isa and then uh, Robert. Hello, hi Angela, it's uh, good hey, to see so. you again. So excited to have you here. Um, so my question, it's kind of two parts. So one, I'm asking this from your perspective as a classroom teacher. So we have these proofs of concept and you know, it's the educator's role to modify the context to increase the probability that a student will have an experience that will reinforce you know, these, these ideas that are valuable and promote learning. But um, I mean, educators have so many things they have to do for you know other other reasons other than like the students in the seats. So you mentioned the Kahneman, the myth of achievement tests. How how do you or how would an educator grapple with all the different demands? Um, this term achievement tests are still a reality. Like how do we think of ways to infuse these proofs of concept? in what we're already doing without having like a completely different curriculum, number one. And then number two, having a tough time formulating this question, but um, you talked about David Yeager's work and, and seeking a, or a challenge seeking culture. I'm thinking about the culture in terms of like, you know, the greatest whole or the web of meaning and that is physics or science and, and what elements of this culture that are so difficult to pinpoint are detrimental to our students' learning and shape the attitudes um, of our students in a way that interferes with their development of identity and these, you know, character development as a scientist, seeing themselves embedded in, in this world as capable, agentic um, students. So that is, I think, two questions, both, both like really good ones and both like huge ones. So let me just say um, briefly and inadequately, the first thing you were saying is like, how do teachers like, like the, great <laughs> growth mindset, great. Like also all the other things, gratitude, great. Like all the other things, it's like, 
how the heck am I going to like somehow teach physics and, you know, help, you know, students now develop a whole suite of other things that, you know, I'm mean, gravity is hard enough, right? Like it's like, so, okay. So I was sitting um, uh, next to a superintendent, the superintendent um, in Orange County, Florida. It's like the ninth biggest school district in the country. I think something like that. It's huge. And Dr. Jenkins, who I guess has a first name, but everyone calls her Dr. Jenkins. Anyway, Dr. Jenkins, and certainly to me, Dr. Jenkins, um, I said, what, like, I was like, if you were my boss and I just worked for you, like, what would you tell me to do for you, for these students in Orange County? And she said, I would say, don't give me one more thing. Um, she was like, we are, <laughs> we are working. We are just, please don't give me like, oh, here, here's one more thing to somehow like shoehorn in to this guy. So, so I think infuse is the word you used, Issa, and I think that's right. So the question is, like, if you're not going to take out, like, 20 minutes of physics class so that you can, like, do a little lecture on growth mindset, like, what, what can you do? I first of all think that, you know, in the, long, in the long school year that there is, there might be an occasional time where you could do a little commercial, like, because, you know, remember how short this intervention was? It doesn't take you, like, 19 hours to explain to the students that, hey, by the way, new neuroscience is showing that the brain is plastic not fixed, right? I mean, you don't want to spend 19 hours doing that. You could have a little five minute commercial on that um, and plenty of things to Google and find like, um, you know, on David Yeager's website, on Character Lab. Uh, Character Lab actually has all these like really short things where you can just like literally email it to your student or like copy and paste it. We're making PowerPoint so teachers not. So like you can make little commercials and that is one more thing. But the infused thing I think is the right thing, which is um, say for example, with growth mindset, you're like, how do I, how do I infuse a growth mindset into my physics classroom? One way is that like when you make a mistake, which you do, because as Eric pointed out at the beginning of the call, we are all apparently human, right? You know, you miscalculate something. You forget to tell students that like, you know, they can raise their hand like this, but like you just goof, right? One of the things that you can do to model a growth mindset and to encourage is actually to, um, it's how you handle failures, your own and others, right? So you say things like, you're like, you know, awesome, I made this mistake. I'm so glad I learned from it, right? Like you, you basically like model for them that it's not terrible. You don't feel like an idiot. I mean, you could make jokes about it, but like you model that failure is part of learning. One of the teachers that I love, he's a, not an AP physics teacher, he's an AP um, econ teacher on his blackboard um, when he had a real school. And now, anyway, there's a virtual version of this. He has, his last name is Bressler. So he has a little scorecard called wrestlers blunders and um, the students um, get to like put a, a, a tick mark every time he makes a mistake, any kind of mistake. And um, when they get to 20, they all get, get free pizza or something, right? And it's just a way of being like, awesome, I, I'm making mistakes, you're making mistakes, like we're learning from them, you know? So, so that's an example of infusing. And I think this gets a little bit to your second question about culture, Issa, because I think that the cultures that um, encourage growth mindset and grit and, and kindness and curiosity, really actually, you could argue like, oh my God, is this gonna be like a, a to-do list of 45 things I have to do to create a classroom culture? It's like, really there's only two things I think a classroom has to be culturally um, to encourage these things. And, um, and, and I'm not saying it's a complete list, but these are the two most important things. Like one is that um, there, it has to be uh, supportive not just in terms of warmth, but also in terms of respect. So like psychologists would call these by fancy names, but I think it's, it needs to be a supportive classroom. Kids have to feel like you like them, you care about them, and also that you respect them, especially if they're teenagers, right? But like also if just if they're human. Um, and um, I think that's why questions about diversity and inclusion and equity and, but basically a student can have a completely different point of view. Of you. I mean, I know there's a right answer in a physics problem, but just like to, ha to have a culture where like, you listen first to what they have to say. You assume that they're just as valuable and have dignity as a human being as like anybody else. And, and they feel your warmth, you know? And a kid walks into a classroom and like, my teacher likes me. My teacher respects me. That's supportive. And the second thing you have to do is be demanding, right? You basically have to be that, ki that teacher who's like, everyone knows. I mean, Eric was my teacher in physics and I thought he was both of these things, like supportive and demanding. It was like, wow, this professor actually likes us and the, he really respects us. And holy shit, this is really hard. Like, like, like 
he keeps asking me to do something I can't yet do. And that's the magical combination, supportive and demanding. And we've all had those teachers. I had Mrs. Farron in eighth grade. She was the most supportive, most demanding teacher. And my grammar is perfect. (laughs) I learned so much about grammar in her classroom. So culturally, we have to, in, in ways that are probably not like, oh, here's your curriculum, but more like we model, we have these little things, it becomes part of practice, we, we communicate those two things. And I think when you have a supportive and demanding classroom, things like growth mindset, things like self-efficacy, things like kindness, you know, things like teamwork kind of grow in, in that very fertile soil. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Angela. So, um... Robert uh, Krakow, and maybe briefly for the sake of everybody, but especially our guest, Angela, introduce yourself and say where you're uh, teaching. Hey, so I'm Rob. Uh, I'm a physics teacher in New York, and I'm finishing my doctorate up at Stony Brook. Um, And one of the questions, I mean, there's a million of them, but kind of condense it because I'd like to hear your thoughts. right, is the idea of like the sort of cultural reproduction that you're discussing, um, that it's kind of all inclusive. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned, um, and I think Issa touched on it, is kind of the idea of the teacher growth as well, um, especially like physics teacher growth and the implementation of NGSS and all this, you know, COVID hitting and hybrid teaching and that. Um, and how you might think, or one of the things that you've maybe come across is how to get some of our colleagues to kind of buy into the program and to, to grow, right. To say like, okay, I can do the hybrid or I can do the NGSS or I, you know, I can do this, not I'm five years from retirement. You know, I can, I can sort of check out. You know, you're all here on Saturday morning, right? So it's like, it's not even preaching to the converted. It's like preaching to the preachers, I guess, right? Like, and then the question might be like, how do we preach more effectively to our colleagues, right? If that's sort of, you know, that is actually what um, Carol Dweck and David Yeager and their, you know, supporting cast are now working on. They're like, okay, we did these random assignment studies at the student level. We learned a lot about how important the teacher and the school is. I guess we have to change the teachers and the schools. So now we have to change these grown-ups, right? Like not, not helping 15 year olds change their minds, but changing 55 year olds minds. Right. Um, and um, I don't think they know yet how to do that. Um, um, I, 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 and I think it's actually harder. I, I, um, I had these uh, friends or colleagues, they study little kids, right? They're developmental psychologists and they study like four year olds. Right. And I was like, what's one thing you've learned from like, spending your whole life studying like executive function and four-year-olds and how to improve it. And they're like, what we learned is even though the brain is plastic, it's whole life course. We'd rather be changing four-year-olds than changing 54-year-olds are just so much easier to change. <laughs> like, you're like, yeah. So it's not easy, I think, with teachers um, and, um, and principals. The one thing I will say is that um, I think you um, can remember this one principle from like basically all of human nature. So it works through students for, you know, I, I mentioned very briefly, like students can get a hypothesis, like, hmm, maybe you can get smarter. That's an interesting idea. I never thought about that before. Um, and then it has to be confirmed. Um, and one of the scientists, I know Issa really admires this guy named Al Bandura. He's at Stanford. He's like 98 years old or something. And is the single most cited psychologist in history, I think, um, more than Freud. And, um, and his advice is that when people have like a hunch, like they have, they have confidence, but it's fragile. Like they're kind of like, I don't know, maybe I will spend a little more time on my lesson plan, or maybe I can actually do this remote thing. Like, I don't, it's like, it's a hunch. And the thing that they really need is confirmation evidence. So they need uh, small wins. So he has other words for it, like mastery experiences or whatever. So um, when a teacher is like, at least given the hypothesis that maybe my teaching can be as effective in this remote situation as maybe that, that then that has to be confirmed in some way. They need to actually do something um, to be, and then if you ask Al Bandura, like, well, how do you do that? Usually it's like giving the, helping the person identify something which is small enough that they're going to win at it. Right. And, and parents do this all the time. You know, you break down something like really hard into something and you kind of like strategically make sure that the next step is, is like that they're going to. So like, if you're trying to get teachers to use breakout rooms, 
you have to make sure that like the first time they use breakout rooms, it's like they have enough support and they get enough feedback that like it's a win. And then they're like, oh, wow, I tried something new with my teaching. Like I sent students to breakout rooms and I did it in this way. And like, wow, students all like had happy faces. And then, you know, somebody else told me it was great. And, da, da, and that encourages them to keep going. So that's just one basic behavioral principle that I think doesn't make the problem easy, but is, is, is probably something useful to think, keep in mind. Awesome, thanks. Thank you. So, uh, Cecilia Negorescu, you have had your hand up patiently there. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm Cecilia and I'm a high school teacher in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And I am in um, finishing my studies of becoming also a growth mindset uh, educational coach. And now coming back, I, I really enjoyed your presentation, by the way. But uh, you mentioned there very nicely, give feedback and reflect, or at least uh, being in the shoes of a student would be nice to seek some feedback and reflection by the end of, of a practice. Um, my question is, as a, as a teacher, once that you're dealing with a class of 25 kids, how often would, from your point of view, would be preferable to give some feedback? daily weekly how do you see that so um feedback on um on on anything or like feedback on something in particular well this is the point because i also learned in uh, two years time that it's it's very important to give uh three different types of feedback feedback on their mood feedback on their uh let's say focus and feedback on how they actually uh, try to, to grab the amount of work and uh, the, let's say, the complexity of the work that they have chosen. Okay, so let me give a, a general answer to this, um, uh, which is like feedback. So this, there's a science of learning and, you know, what does it say? Well, it says a few things, but one of the things that is pretty incontrovertible and pretty intuitive to all of you, I'm sure, is that you really can't learn anything without feedback. I mean, like, you know, if, if you need to give an example to your students, it's like, imagine you're trying to get better at foul shot shooting, right? And, you know, every time you shoot the basket, you can't see you, when it, whether it goes in or not. It's like, sure. you will not get any better at foul shot shooting. You'll just be exactly where you were, you know, at the beginning. So feedback is important for literally everything, right? And, um, and, and sometimes feedback can be misleading, but feedback is essential. And, then, and, and most um, cognitive scientists would say, that um, in general, uh, as, a, as a rule, and there's always exceptions, but as a rule, immediate feedback is better than delayed feedback, yeah. right? So then the question is like, okay, it sounds like my job as a teacher is for whatever I'm asking students to improve on, in general, and there are some exceptions, like immediate and constant feedback is better, right? You wouldn't want to say like, oh, I get it. So then one out of every seven times you take a shot, I'll tell you whether it got in, right? You always want that. I think it's really more of an engineering challenge. Like, all right, that's what we're supposed to do. How in my classroom of 25, 35, I mean, 39 kids, like, how would I, how do I do that? I think this is one reason why um, there are like two things that a teacher could do structurally that would just make it more like possible for more kids to get more frequent feedback. One is technology, right? Like that is, I think, one of the big things of technology. It's like, you know, you're on a program and it's like, oh yeah, you don't have to wait seven days for me to tell you what the answer is. Exactly. Because I had to, but right. So technology. And the second thing is team, like the, the kind of peer instruction that, um, you know, Eric's doing um, in his course and that uh, some of my favorite teachers are doing because when you pair, you know, I have this feeling all the time when I'm lecturing in my undergraduate class, when I'm talking, 124 students are listening, right? That means that like one person's talking, 124. If I'm giving feedback to Veronica, I'm giving feedback to one person, 123 students are more or less waiting around, right? When you do things in teams or in pairs, then it's like, 50% of the kids are talking to each other, like, you know, and getting feedback from it. So, so there is something about like making it not, uh, you know, I mean, Eric is the one who flipped the classroom first, yeah. so, but I, I think that's one of the reasons why is that among other things, most things that work, work for multiple reasons. And I think um, flipped classrooms work for multiple reasons, but one of them is that students are giving each other feedback and, and it's, it's much more 
uh, effective for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons is that it's just like more, you know, like there's just like more feedback happening. Thank you. Clear. Great. Thank you, uh, Cecilia, for the question, Angela, for the great response. Um, Jennifer, uh, you're up next. Hi, I'm Jen Mosher. I live in Philly, too, and I teach high school physics at Moorestown Friends School in New Jersey. Oh, uh, yeah. I grew up in Cherry Hill. Okay, so yeah, right down the street. Yep. Um, so my question was about how to encourage challenge seeking at the school level because um, my school is just starting a strategic planning cycle. And so are there particular things that schools can do? Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you about that growth mindset study and how we um, measure challenge seeking. So um, in the same study, all the kids uh, all the kids in the placebo control and also in the intervention condition, they had this ma make a math worksheet exercise. And you can imagine what, how your students would do on such a task. So um, we gave them all kinds of um, like math problems and they were marked easy, medium, hard. And then they were kind of in the ninth grade curriculum, like sort of easy, medium and hard. Um, and they uh, were just asked like, why don't you make your own math worksheet? Like, and you could just like, you know, put these things together and then you're going to do the math worksheet. Right. And challenge seeking was the proportion of harder problems that students voluntarily decided to make when they made their own math worksheet. Then we were like, OK, just kidding. You don't have to do the math worksheet because we ran out of time. But like that was the task. Right. So you can imagine in your class, if you had students with like easy, medium and hard problems, would they want to do the easy ones that they would probably get all right? Would they want to do the medium ones where they'd get most of them right? Or do you think they would want like hard ones? I mean, not impossible ones, but like hard ones that would be really like challenging, good, good possibility that they get things wrong. So I think what you're aiming for is a culture where um, there is an appetite for challenge, right? It's like, it, um, so then the question is, how do you do that? And it, it gets a little bit back to Issa's thing, but I'll tell you about a study. So I did a study where we surveyed kids at the very beginning of the school year on culture. Um, and there were two kinds of questions. Um, one is about a culture of basically performance, right? Like, you know, in, in this uh, school, like um, the smartest kids are treated better. Like, you know, it's really important to show like how smart you are to, um, uh, teachers like the kids better who like get everything right that, that kind of question there are other questions that were really it means really more about growth mindset that's another way of thinking about like like in this school making mistakes is okay as long as you're learning you know in this in this school like you know teachers really believe like all kids can learn so you can think of it in in a way as sort of a, a fixed versus a growth mindset culture you can use other words but those were the kinds of questions and what we found is that if you um, have a school culture or students feel like the culture is more of a kind of like learning is great, everybody can learn, you know, people make mistakes, it's terrific, like that, that led to measurable increases in, in this case, it was a grit study, so increases in grit, and that actually led to increases in uh, grade points average according to school records. So I think the take home here is, can you create a school that emphasizes learning and mistake making as a, as a means of learning? And here's what not to do, which I see in a lot of schools, including, I'm sorry to say, I guess I shouldn't say, well, my own kid's school, right? So they have these like, uh, I know this is recorded, but whatever. So like, they have these ceremonies, honestly, they're like, we're going to have an honor society like a ceremony and the great, the, the smart kids are going to go on stage and everybody else has to just like watch them. And then we're all going to applaud for them. And then honestly, teachers get up and say these horrible things. Like they, they just say things that like make everybody who's not on stage feel stupid and like worthless. And I'm, all, I'm like cringing in the back of the auditorium. I'm like, why would you do that? And honestly, do we really need to have this um, honor? I know my own daughter doesn't even want to be on stage. She's dying too. Like nobody wants this. Like why would you separate kids into the smart kids and the dumb kids? Like, and also I don't even believe it's true. Um, my own daughter who was not on stage, the other one, I have two daughters, went to Harvard and she's like, I'm trying to get her to take, you know, um, Eric's class. And, and so interesting to me that she was never on stage. <laughs> she was just like, I guess she wasn't smart enough. So, so I do think that there are sometimes these things that are probably not badly intentioned, but the, but the collateral damage is there. And I think that sometimes we have gifted and talented programs. We have like honors. Like another thing that the school does, they're like, oh, we're going to give a standing ovation to the kids who aren't like, who, who got this on their grades. And now we're going to give a standing ovation for it. And literally at the end, there's only like two kids who are not standing up. And I'm thinking to myself, like, 
if I were that kid and everybody else is standing up and everybody else got applauded, okay, now it's time for lunch, right? So I think there are things to do, like, you know, model mistake making, you know, make sure that, you know, there's systems in place where if a student gets, you know, a 70% on a physics test, there's a, you know, way to correct their responses, maybe get half their points back. So maybe they can get an 82, whatever. There's things like that. And there's things not to do. And I think one of the things is like not to shame kids, not to emphasize rank ordering of kids, and, you know, not to signal that like some kids are gifted and talented and they're like destined for greatness and like the rest of you are not. So I, I think there are things to do and things not to do. So uh, that raises a question in my mind though, aren't, you know, maybe some of the standardized test, standardized testing, and aren't they all in conflict with that? I mean, what do you right think about standardized testing, Eric? I beg your pardon? What do you think about standardized testing? I know it's a big topic, so it's an unfair question, but what do you think about it? Yeah, well, first of all, we need to we need to specify what we mean by standardized testing, right? Because there, there's a lot of different types of testing. I, I think that a lot of testing, for example, that's done, um, you know, the, at the AP level in the sciences, I don't know about other, other disciplines, um, you know, admissions testing like SAT and ACT. From my perspective, they don't really measure what I really want to know about my students and, and, and you know, I, I've started to think of it more as a social injustice almost than, than, than something that is meaningful, you know, at all. And, and it's certainly, I can see how, you know, especially when you're teaching in high school and you know that that test is coming, you know, you feel that your hands are kind of tied because you need to make sure that, that, that your students are going to score as well as possible on those tests because that is going to determine their admissions to college and so on. And, you know, and then forget about gross mindset and about uh, character and grit and whatever. Let's do whatever is needed in order to, to, to get the highest possible scores. And in some sense, it's even in the end, it, it even reflects back on the teacher, right? Because the school district will look at that too. So would you like, if you are in charge, would you like um, remove them? Like from like, let's take SAT scores or whatever, would you? They're gone. I mean, Harvard is no longer looking at them and the GRE, I got rid of the GRE too. At, and at least in our, in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, we're no longer even permitting students to put the GRE on their application forms. Wow. Uh, yeah. I didn't know those things. Okay, I am not a policymaker. I think here's one thing though I will say. Campbell is this like very famous psychologist. His name was Don Campbell. And like towards the end of his uh, career and his life, he wrote this little essay called Campbell's Law. And he was like, here's one thing I can tell you that um, when you have a measurement, like of anything, like a questionnaire, like the grit scale or a standardized test, like the SAT math section or AP physics, he was like, he's like, um, when you study it kind of purely in a lab or something, okay, that's one thing. But when you put it into practice, like you now make it part of high stakes testing or college admissions or gifted and talented testing, it's like Campbell's law is that there will be unintended consequences, right? That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do things, but, but you should always be expecting unintended consequences. Like I think the the idea of standardized testing is just to have an apples to apples comparison. Um, and I know I have a student who is coming to be my PhD student next year. He, he was uh, born in Chile and he grew up in Peru. And when he applied to me, I literally couldn't even understand that the GPA, it's like on a 17 point scale. And like, I never heard, I'm also ignorant. So I was just like, what is this university? Like where? Like it, but I could see that he had good GRE scores. So like, I, I'm saying things are complicated. Like he said to me, I don't think you would have noticed my application. None of my professors are famous. Like, I, I just, I don't come from your country. Like, I'm glad I had a GRE score to show you so that you could at least look at me and then start talking to me. So I think things are complicated and I can see advantages, but I do think Campbell's law is true, which is there are always unintended consequences also. Now how the pros and cons, like, then tell you what to do. I don't know, but I can tell you there's always unintended consequences. And I think, uh, I think for measurement, that's, um, you know, a rule, right? Like, and so I don't, I don't know what to do about standardized tests. I do think there's a unintended consequence that it narrows things. It makes learning very extrinsic, very formulaic, you know, it encourages cramming, like superficial learning, like 
all these things that are bad, those are unintended consequences, but I, I don't want to say that there are no benefits to them because, you know, there was a reason why they were created in the first place. So, yeah. I, 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 think, I think one of the reasons is because it makes it much easier to take decisions on admissions. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I guess like that. that but, and, but, and, I, but I would, I would, I would it's like a false argue, precision. I, yeah. I would argue that in general, if you have an easy metric, it's probably not a very informative metric. Interesting. Well, I really would. I mean, maybe that'll be another phone call. And I really would love to um, talk about that. Not like I have a, I don't have a position on it. I'm not like, oh, everybody should. I honestly like think it's just such an interesting and important problem. And I, I've been working with like Danny Kahneman on judgment. And I'll just say you're right. But when people see a number, it's like 790. It's like, it's so clear. They will overweight that number versus something else. Like, hey, is this kid kind? It's like, I don't know. I don't have a number for it. So like, no, just, just, but, but think about, you know, whatever its value is, think about Bloom's taxonomy at the extremes, right? At the bottom, you know, remembering facts and at the top creativity. And you can argue about what's in the middle, but to some degree, one is a low order thinking skill, one is a high order thinking skill. The, only the bottom one is easily measurable and quantifiable. It's mm, very interesting, yeah. A, as you actually work up towards, you know, things like creativity, analysis, evaluation. Like synthesis, I mean, you, right, yeah. You can, or, or, or gross mindset mm. or a, anything that then, or, or, you know, it becomes much harder to quantify. Ah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Liang Yang, you are next one up. Uh, hello. Uh, Hi. I'm Liang Yang, I'm actually a um, physics professor at UC San Diego, but I work with uh, high school uh, teachers and middle school teachers. So one thing um, I find in the students is uh, motivation, both the college level and the high school level. Even my, my friend's kids, who basically was asking me the other day, why do they study uh, quadratic uh, equations? What's the use? I tried to explain you know, the standard things, but it's not getting through to the kids. You know, a lot of them, they just don't find the things interesting or useless, but they have to study. I don't know how to, uh, how to motivate kids. Um, motivation is, um, let's see, there are a few principles, right? But I want to say it's like, oh, do this, because there are a few principles. So there's a few reasons why a could, kid wouldn't be motivated, right? So it's not like one size fits all because, okay, one of the problems that the kid might have is confidence or self-efficacy. I think students are not motivated to do things they don't think they can do. So if a kid, but this isn't necessarily the kid you're talking about. So that's why there's a multiple choice here. So like if a student is like, I don't, I'm not interested in physics because I, I'm terrified of it. Like, I don't think I can do it. Then you have to work on confidence, self-efficacy, et cetera, right? Which, you know, like mostly, uh, well, there's lots of ways to do it, but one thing is small wins, right? Then you have to give students like, ways to be successful, like, which is maybe going to where they are, not where everybody else is, right? So that's confidence. But um, the second reason is interest, right? So another reason why students, um, or these things are all really necessary, but not sufficient, honestly. So it's like, you have to have confidence and you have to find interesting. Now, the psychology of interest is itself very interesting. One of the things that makes things interesting is that it's connected somehow to other things that you are already interested in, right? So, for example, history is deeply uninteresting to me. Like, that's why I don't know where Peru is. I'm like, I just, I'm not interested in that. However, I once read a whole history book on, on, a, on the history of the fork, right? Like, apparently at some point people were just eating off of knives and then at some point somebody invented the fork and I read this whole book on the history of the fork and my husband like looks over at me and he was like are you seriously reading a history book and I'm like I know right and he was like oh because it's about cooking and I'm like yeah that is exactly why so it's connected to something I'm already interested in so with the quadratic formula I don't know what that bridge would be but there is this research by Chris Hulliman it's also on character lab under the curiosity playbook it's called making connections but you can take your it's like we, there's a worksheet on there where you can literally have students and it's important that they do this not you they have a list of things that they're already interested in you know usually it's music like you know they're young people so like and then they, there's a second list of like the, the things that you are learning in class right now and so they have like quadratic formula right like you know area of a triangle whatever it is and then uh the make then the third step is they say like you draw the line the student does this not you you draw the line between like anything that you can between the first column and the second column and then they they can start to make a, a thing and and 
And so that I think is one thing. The psychology of interest is that one of the things that makes something interesting is that it's latched onto or connected to something you are already interested in before you learn this other thing. And the third thing is importance. Um, and especially with adolescents, one of the things that is extremely high in adolescents is a sense of purpose, a sense of fairness. You know, that's why I think a lot of the young people are leading the work on social justice and, you know, things that like my own daughters are teaching me about how, you know, like gender issues, sexuality issues, race, ethnicity, class, like, like when you're a teenager, you really care about those things and about being principled, et cetera. So the other reason, the other way that you can get people to um, be motivated other than confidence and interest is importance, right? And, um, and here's a little manipulation that you might find interesting. This one, David Yeager and other uh, scientists developed. Um, uh, I said that you can connect things to things you're interested in. You can also connect things to the students' like deepest values. So um, you, you give them a prompt that basically reads like this. Think about the world and the ways in which you would like it to be different. Some people care about climate change. Some people care about social racial justice. Some people care about poverty. Some people care about like whatever, penguins. Like, where, like what, what do you care about, right? And then the student just like writes a little paragraph. They're like, spelling and grammar doesn't matter. And then they write things. And by the way, teenagers all care about something. Um, and they really are very principled things usually, right? And then, um, the, then very gently, you're like, that's um, like, you know, maybe if you want to, you could think of how some things that you're learning in this class could help you solve that problem. It's very gentle. You ha you can't be like, you should, you know, just this little tilt. And that actually increased academic achievement and feeling feelings of purpose and engagement, et cetera. So I guess the three principles I would say is it, confidence, interest, and importance. Uh, and there are these ways that you can use psychological, like then when you now understand it and you're like, you know what, this kid's th problem is, is not confidence, it's interest. This kid's thing is like, not interest, it's important. And then, and then you can start to use some of these little psychological strategies to help them. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that great question uh, also. Um, so we have about nine minutes left. I just want to be... Um, I want to be aware of the time, but we have one hand up, so that's uh, that's perfect. Matsuda, I think you have two hands up, right? Two? No, one was an applause. Oh, that's so <laughs> true. Thank you, Cecilia. Okay, go ahead. So, Maxuda Afros. So, um, I teach in Houston Chavez High School. I teach IB Physics. So, there are actually a few questions. Um, so, first of all, I just want to comment on the previous person's question. One way of going about it which has, because again, I hear that all the time teaching physics. What's the use of learning about blah, blah, blah. What I've done, and which has helped, is just tell some of the kids very honestly, like most of them might not go into physics, right? They probably will not go into a physics major. But what they learn is the problem solving skills. And then I'll give them an example. Like if you look at this problem, what have you done with it? Something real life. And they actually show I've broken down, blah, 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 blah. And then you take the same idea for a physics or a math question for quadratic equations. And say, just like you have taken these steps of breaking it down, that's what math helps you do. So now they've made that real world connection of not I'm learning a quadratic equation, but I'm actually learning problem solving skills for life. And that has really helped the kids get more motivated. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, I can actually use math to help me problem solve and which I can later on help in anything else. But right. I, mean, I think that I would put that under the category of like importance. It's like, do you care about solving problems? Like, do you care about like, you know, learning to do hard things? Um, like, Okay, well then, that, like, but it checks the box for them. It's like, oh, this is important. Maybe not super interesting. Maybe not like, but like, but like, oh, it's important. Some yeah. Relevance. Um, two questions for you. Question number one is, um, I know you said the standard testing helps in terms of maybe finding those criteria. You know, it's, it's easy to check the box of being able to sort out students, but sometimes it does help what you said. Like if, for example, I'm from Bangladesh and I agree with you, if I didn't have a GRE score, they'd have no way of knowing what I did, right? But on the other hand, it definitely probably is detrimental because the school that I teach in, last year, a lot of my students who applied for MIT, Harvard, or anything, they just did not have the SAT scores, right? It's because the school does not necessarily have the critical thinking mm -hmm. skills taught from an early on to score what they needed to on the SAT, so the, or they're doing so much in school. So what about that particular aspect of it, right? Where you have kids who've got the GPA, who've got the grid, who've got everything else, but it's literally that standardizing score. Um, that's question number one. How would you, what do you think about that? And question number two is, um, you talked about the fact of these honor societies and everything. First of all, let me say, I agree with you with not labeling kids. 
like I teach IB physics and I keep on saying like, I think there's something wrong with labeling because they feel, the kids feel entitled, the others feel I'm never going to reach that level and it creates this really ugliness. Nobody's happy. It's, Nobody's it's, happy. it's bad. It's like lose, lose. It's just bad. But shouldn't we have some way of celebrating achievements to make sure that kids feel like when, they, for every person, the most important thing is acknowledgement, right? Even when these mm-hmm. big salaries come in, bonuses, mm-hmm. people who are rich, they don't need more money. Mm. That bonus is just an acknowledgement, right? So yeah. shouldn't there be something somewhere in a way to celebrate those gains so that I can feel more confident that, okay, if I do this, I'm acknowledged and I can move forward. How would you? Well, that? you get to talk to Eric more than you get to talk to me, right? But I think Eric, I, 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 <laughs> I'm sure he has a better answer for it. But I guess since I only have six more minutes with you, I should, I should speak. I think you're, there's a, um, there's a Israeli, um, psychologist who I just worship. His name is R.A. Kuglansky. And he has this theory that what everyone wants, what all human beings want, and what drives so much of our behavior is what he calls the need for significance, right? Like we, we want to feel like we are higher in esteem status or like, and it drives so much of our behavior. Um, And I think you're right to just to kind of like say like, you know, but there is an instinct that young people and all of us have, right? To gain in the esteem and the recognition and the acceptance, you know, uh, of others. And, And by the way, his theory is that it's because we're primates. It's because like we come from an evolutionary line of like status animals. I mean, so it's just a big driver. So, so I I think that's right. I think um, if there are ways to do it without it being um, a a rank ordering zero sum game between you and other kids, right? Which is maybe there could be more of an emphasis and this is very bloom, right? About like, like to celebrate your, uh, your gains, not relative to the person next to you, but relative to yourself. You know, like, oh my gosh, like, it's so great. I took this video of what you could do at the beginning of ninth grade. And I took this video at the end of ninth grade. Look at these videos next to each other. Like, what? Like, holy smokes. Can you believe you're the same person? And that is a way of celebrating significance without being like, oh, and you did better than Veronica. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, because I think that is, you know, I know that sounds like Pollyanna or whatever, but um, but but I, I think that's actually, you know, I interview a lot of Olympic athletes and obviously they care about how they do relative to other people, but 99% of the time they are comparing themselves with themselves, right? Because like that's the most useful comparison. So I, I guarantee you, they're not like spending 99% of their time like you know, like looking at other people, they, you can't concentrate on your own learning. So I, I would say the need for significance is profound and you would want to do it that way. And then I guess the last thing I'll say like to this um, to this question you have about tests and so forth and the pros and cons and what would you do? What do you do about the kid who's got like, they, they have the ambition, they have a growth mindset, maybe they don't have the test scores, like, but they have grades. Um, I'm involved in the Common Apps. Um, the, the, the president and the CEO of Common App is a wonderful person named Jenny Ricard. <laughs> she wants to revolutionize college admissions. And she is really, truly trying to figure out how can it be more holistic super committed to making it more equitable. Like, I honestly think she like, doesn't sleep at night because she's like, we have to make the system so that it increases equity, not decreases equity, which is an inadvertent consequence of some features of admissions. I don't think they have the answers, but um, she's like convening like, you know, scientists and like policymakers and she's got teachers involved and like guidance counselors from the Chicago public schools and so forth. So I'm optimistic. At least I think there's been, I think the last year has been so hard, but one of the things that has been good, I think, is that there have been some painful like recognition of the urgency of certain things that have been a little bit like on the back burner for 400 years. So, so I'm, I'm optimistic that some good will happen. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Angela. I think we've touched on so many interesting uh, topics. And um, I really have to think hard about, I mean, in in these past um, five or six years, I've started to think more and more about assessment. And uh, I even have a a talk with a rather provocative title, Assessment, the Silent Killer of Learning. And and I, 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 I sort of am realizing that it's very hard to change education unless you change assessment. 
and uh, and and I think that changing assessment, given that there are so many stakeholders, from policymakers to school districts to uh, academic institutions, you know, it's 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 more difficult even than moving a mountain, so to speak. Um, but um, but you. I'll work on that with you. I would love to work on that with you. I mean, ideally, assessment is feedback without the inadvertent consequences that sometimes come with it. But like, I mean, students do need, do need to assess themselves and learn like feedback. I'm all up, thumbs up on feedback. If we can figure, but I, but I don't think there are any easy answers. Like I would love to work on it though with you. We should work on that. Right. Well, no, there are no easy answers. And, and part of it is because, you know, if, if you have an easy answer, it's probably not a, a very meaningful answer. Easy yeah, metric, or, right? I mean, just think about again numerically rating accomplishment on on the different uh, levels of uh, of Bloom's taxonomy. Veronica, you have your hand up. It's eleven fifty nine. I mean, is it a question let's or end, a let's quick end comment? With Ver- let, no, but you can. We'll go. Well, yeah. Anyway, let's let Veronica's because I was, you know, I would love yeah, to. Let me t- okay, reason why I can't put my hand up and down is because y'all was answering my questions, but I wanted, <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't. It didn't make sense to repeat it. I just got a comment. How do we change the wording of getting, you know, of assessments instead of, you know, because I try Mm. to stop saying assessments. I try Mm. to stop saying exams. I said, we know what we're going to do. We're going to check for your understanding. What do you know? How Mm. can I think if we change the word Mm. is to just be a little bit more comfortable? So so that's my, that's what I'm putting out there. How can we change this word? Do you have the word, Veronica? What's the word? I I, I use check for understanding. Check for understanding. I say, what do you understand? I, and I always say, you know what, today we're doing it. I try to get them hype. And so I just yeah. say, we're going to check yeah. to see what you understand. I got to try to put a rhyme to it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I like rhymes. And then, Eric, you were saying feedback. I think feedback doesn't have as positive connotations. I mean, at a certain age, you just learn that feedback's usually eek, like, Oh no, I'm going to get feedback. So, so I, I, I think you're right though, Veronica, the language really does matter. It, it carries so much, you know, like, like all of the, the, the karma of the word, you know, is it a negative word? Is it a positive word? Is it like, does it make me think of my own ego? Does it not make me? Um, but, um, and I think feedback's probably better than assessment, maybe check for understandings better than feedback. And then I think we can keep, keep thinking about that. Um, yeah. Um, I, I completely agree. Um, well, I'm sorry we're out of time. I really, really, I wanted to say thank you because I'm going to think about everything that was said and all the questions for uh, the rest of the day and longer than that. And, um, you know, maybe there'll be another conversation in our, in our future. Well, the, that w- I'm, I'm sure everybody, certainly me, but I, I think I speak on behalf of all of us here that we'd be, we'd be absolutely thrilled so <laughs> thank you so much angela Thanks, for Eric. a uh, for a fantastic discussion thank you all for coming we don't yet have the date for our march speaker but that will be announced pretty uh, pretty shortly okay. so thank, thank you, all. you sarah and everyone else for um making it possible have a wonderful saturday if if saturday is the time zone you're in <laughs> okay <laughs> yes <laughs> see you bye-bye. all bye-bye bye